Hello and welcome to Newsmax TV. I'm David Patton. Joining us now, Daniel Hannon, author of a fascinating new book, Inventing Freedom, How the English-Speaking Peoples Made the Modern World. An Oxford graduate, he was first elected to the European Parliament in 1999 at the tender age of 27. He's been re-elected a couple of times since. Daniel Hannon, thank you for joining us. Thank you. So among the American and British innovations that you talk about in the book, personal liberty, jury trials, freedom of the press, elections, habeas corpus, property rights, religious pluralism. Now people today sort of take these for granted as the institutions that come with Western civilization, but you say it's a little more specific than that. Can you elaborate, please? Sure, it is the most natural thing to be blasé about what's familiar to us, to take things for granted. Mm -hmm. Maybe I was in a slightly different category because I was born and brought up in Peru, in South America. Uh, you might not think so to look at me, but I'm your typical Latino target voter for the next election. And I can remember when I was five years old, the property seizures, there was a mob that attacked our family farm. You know, it's not the kind of thing you forget, my mother taking me to the footpath and the back way out saying we're going to have to play a game. If we have to come this way again, you have to do it without making a sound. And it was only a few years later that the really extraordinary thing hit me, which is that no one was especially surprised by that kind of thing. It was taken for granted in South America that property was contingent, that constitutions came and went, that what you had could be seized either with or without official sanction. And it was also taken for granted that these things didn't happen in the English-speaking world. So when we use the word the West, we're really being polite. What we really mean by the West is countries that adopted the Anglo-American system of government. The virtues that you reeled off in your question there, personal freedom and equality before the law and regular elections and all of those things, they are not the natural condition of an advanced society. The, the conceit of our age is to think that everyone's going to get there when they get rich enough and educated enough. History tells another story. These were ideas overwhelmingly developed in the language that you and I are now talking. Well, it makes a lot of sense if we want to appreciate and preserve these really a historic institutions that we're blessed to have, it might be a good idea to have some sense where they actually come from. Now, you write in the book about the Anglosphere and seem to suggest that the world community ought to appreciate British colonialism and the 20th century uh, emergence of America as a superpower. Uh, but obviously, in some circles, that's going to be a controversial idea, right? I'm sure that within seconds of this interview going live, all sorts of people will be posting negative reviews, accusing us of racism and colonialism and so on. But the, the ideals of the Anglosphere are not passed on by insemination. They're passed on by intellectual exchange, and they can take root anywhere. The Anglosphere is why Bermuda is not Haiti. The Anglosphere is why Hong Kong is not China, why Singapore is not Indonesia. The great Indian writer and holder of the UNESCO Peace Chair, uh, Madhav Das Nalapat, had a lovely phrase. He said, it's defined not by the blood of the body, but by the blood of the mind. We uniquely had a civilization that stumbled upon this idea that the law was above the government rather than the other way around. Now, nowadays, that sounds banal, platitudinous almost, but think of how radical it was when you first had that idea. Here was this concept that you couldn't touch or taste or smell, but that it was bigger than the king, bigger than the strongest guy in the tribe, and it bound everybody equally. The state was the servant of the individual rather than the other way around. That, in a way, is Anglosphere exceptionalism. And we make a mistake if we think that everyone is going to get there through a process of parallel evolution. The reason that we now call those values Western values, if we're being completely honest, is because of a series of military victories by the English-speaking peoples. That's what disseminated them. Fascinating. Well, we know, for example, that President Obama, um, once he took office, sent the bust back of Winston Churchill that had proudly stood in the White House. Is President Obama, in your view, an Anglophobe? And what are the implications of that globally if he is? Yeah, I think this is probably the first occupant of the White House who feels absolutely nothing 
for what we've just been talking about, or at least nothing good. Even the earliest presidents, even the ones who had themselves been part of the Revolutionary War, very much saw themselves as part of a very old English liberal tradition, Whig tradition. Washington, Jefferson, Adams, you look at how they spoke and wrote, they didn't think that they had invented liberty in 1776. They saw themselves as part of a, a centuries-old patrimony that went back through the English Bill of Rights, back through the Magna Carta, back even to the folk right of Anglo-Saxon common law in the earliest English-speaking kingdoms. This is, I think, the first time that we've had somebody who has no sense of that at all. And it's, you know, it's not the giving back of the bust that, that matters. That's the symbol. It's the implication that the bits of the American Constitution that came from the Anglosphere tradition, the emphasis on personal liberty, on small government, on individualism, on absolute sanctity of property and contract, if those things are no longer special, if those things no longer define this polity, then America is devalued. It comes to look just like anywhere else. Well, then, do you believe that President Obama's rejection of the special heritage and traditions of the United States and the UK could explain, perhaps, a US foreign policy that appears to see the United States and the United Kingdom as really no more exceptional than any other country and therefore uh, not fit to uh, perhaps fully exercise power in the global sphere, to maintain global order, to you know, sort of encourage the spread uh, of these traditions that you talk about that are so important. Sure. I mean, I think there is uh, an anti-colonialist tinge. Now, of course, on one level, there's always been an anti-colonialist aspect to, to uh, the US. It's a, it's a republic. It's not an empire, that lovely phrase of Russell Kirk's. But there's something more than that. There's, there's a sense of kind of writing what he sees as the imbalance globally between the haves and the have-nots. I mean, here's a little example of it. When Argentina invaded the Falkland Islands 25 years ago, Ronald Reagan was in no doubt about whose side he was on. He saw an English-speaking democracy threatened by a neighboring autocracy, and in his gut he knew which side he was on, and, and so did the American people. I mean, there was a, 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 a vote in the Senate that went through with 99 to 1 calling for an Argentine withdrawal, the one being that wonderfully contrarian Jesse Helms. Compare that to today, where this administration is using exactly the language of Argentina, is basically lining up with a quasi-autocratic Peronist state in Argentina, and with Bolivarian uh, Venezuela, and with Sandinista Nic Nicaragua. I think Obama looks at the, uh, at the Falklands not as a, an English-speaking democracy, but as a colonial relic. But just think about this. I mean, if the Falkland Islands is a colonial accident, uh, a new world territory that just happened to be settled by English speakers who have a stubborn attachment to representative government and the rule of law, then what's this country? Certainly sounds like a completely different perspective on US and, and English history. What uh, lessons do you see in inventing freedom regarding the rising US Anglo competition with China and its emergence? Well, I think that, I mean, Hegel had a lovely phrase. He said, the owl of Minerva spreads its wings only with the gathering of the dusk. On most measures, the Anglo-American imperial, uh, imperium, which has dominated the world in a broadly benign way, not a perfect way, obviously. We've had our faults, like all countries, you, you and we. But that we, we've sucked, by and large, more and more people into a system that allows for their freedom, allows for their development as individuals. I think on most measures, our power is waning. But it doesn't follow that Anglosphere values are over. On the contrary, I think with our unique emphasis on individualism, we're very well suited to the internet age. And I think the really critical geopolitical question of the 21st century is this one. Will India primarily self-identify as an Anglosphere democracy or as an Asian superpower. If the former, well, then the 21st century looks an awful lot brighter, doesn't it? Well, Daniel Hannan, author of Inventing Freedom and member of the European Parliament, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And thank you for watching Newsmax TV.